Hello, lovely internet strangers. Welcome to the next installment of The Eighth Square's Corner. This is a more off-the-cuff format than my usually very planned videos, and today I'm going to talk about white supremacy in libraries and how to dismantle it. You have likely never heard of white supremacy in libraries because you lead a better life than me, but I have a personal connection to this topic because my mother is a librarian. She is a public librarian in a community library. She got her master's in library science, or MLS, and then spent a little bit of time working, I believe, in a university library before she quit to have children. I can't recall exactly, but probably when I was around 10, she started going back to work on a substitute basis and then on a regular part-time basis. And then once she had an empty nest, she went full-time. I keep in regular touch with my family and my mother is very chatty and loves to talk about working at the library. And there is a lot of drama, let me tell you. The thing about libraries, which I'm going to address when I read this article, is that except for the private libraries, they are government institutions, they are run by the government, their budgets are controlled by the government. So when people in articles like this make suggestions about budget, I'm like, who are you directing this at? The people reading this article who work in the library system are very unlikely to be the people that have the power to allocate where the budget goes. My mother complains all the time about initiatives that are being pushed from top down, and no matter what they say, no matter what case is made, it doesn't matter. The higher-ups have some kind of idea about what they want to spend money on, even if it's a complete waste. So let's just get into the article and I will ramble along with it. I picked this article as a basis for the video because I kind of troll my mother a little bit by sending her posts like this about white supremacy in libraries and how libraries are racist, etc. And she's always like, why do you hurt me? <laughs> I mean, she's fairly close to retirement age, so probably none of this will really affect her all that much. But you know, it's good to keep up with the forces headed your way. So the post is called Dismantling White Supremacy in Public Libraries. Like nice white librarians, the title probably made you bristle. Knowing the swift and harsh criticism leveraged from nice white librarians when urged to read more inclusively in order to better serve the communities, it's probably even more painful to wake up to the reality public libraries in America are steeped in white supremacist ideas. There have been pushes for more diversity in the field, an admirable step for a better, more representative workforce. But until the structures that allow white supremacy are dismantled, the public libraries of America will continue to be institutions privileging whiteness. A better, more representative workforce. Is that implying that better and more representative go together? Because you can just throw people in there that are more representative that are not better at their jobs. She provides no explanation of what privileging whiteness means. She's going to throw some things out in this article, but really nothing that holds water in my opinion. Let's just ignore the fact that public libraries are a place where children of color get access to quality materials to further their education, especially the ones that are poor, especially the ones that don't have access to a computer at home, because libraries are no longer just about books, they are about information and access to computers. This chick goes on, but that's how it's always been done is the common refrain and the common meme about why things don't change in libraries. The reality is, the way things have always been done is privileged, elitist, and racist. It shouldn't take mass protests and continued murder of black people at the hands of the police to cause change. But now more than ever, amid the uprising for racial justice and the changing workplace norms in light of a global pandemic, is an opportunity to change. Public libraries not changing right now should feel shame and embarrassment for not doing better. WTF do libraries have to do with police killing black people? Whatever you think about the statistics and the reality of what's happening, what does that have to do with libraries? I can't find the connection. And like I said, the way it's always been done comes from the fact that these are government-run institutions. What does the government do? What it's always done. There's a huge messy bureaucracy. The technological tools provided by the government in 2021 are seriously sad. Like things we figured out how to build in the private sector years ago, the government still hasn't caught up. So this article is from summer 2020, so I get why she's zeroing in on black people, but black people aren't the only non-white people. There are Latinos, Asians of all stripes. Who cares about them though? It's simple, not doing better doesn't serve your community. And no, your community, no matter where you are, isn't all nice white people who vote a certain way, speak a certain language, and follow a simple set of norms. That's what you're choosing to see and privilege. Your community, even in one comprise 100% of those who identify as white, is diverse in capacities you cannot comprehend if you don't take the time to do just that. More, if your community is 100% white, you have a lot of work to do to open their eyes to the rest of the world, which is the furthest thing from that bubble. Where do I even begin with everything that was 
stupid about what she just said. She put the word norms in quotation marks as if it's offensive to have a code of conduct, behaviors that you expect all people to adhere to. If you don't think that people of color can conform to basic standards of decency, to me that seems like the bigotry of low expectations. No library I've ever been to has had anything that appeared to be race-based norms to me, unless walking through a building, browsing books, using the computer, and working quietly is a white thing. I thought it was an offensive stereotype that non-white people are loud AF, but I guess it's not. It's just their way and we need to like, you know, accept that or something. I don't know. I'm trying to guess what the hell she's talking about. And yes, just because your community is all white doesn't mean that there aren't different sexualities in there. Doesn't mean that you don't have Russians and Polish people and Jewish people, all of whom just appear to be whitey white white and they all have very different cultural norms, etc. But even though they say you should serve your community, so if your community is 100% white, serve your community, right? But no, if your community is 100% white, you need to expose them to the rest of the world. Okay, what if you're in a community that's like almost 100% black? Is it your responsibility to expose them to the rest of the world, to the world of white people? I bet they would not make that argument, but if they don't make that argument, then they are a damn hypocrite. All right, so things that they list as being white supremacist in libraries are requiring an ID for service and cards. So it's the same argument that the voters rights people make that people who aren't white can't figure out how to get an ID or can't afford it. I mean, in the community where my mother lives, if you don't have a driver's license, you're not getting to the library most likely because it's not an area where you can get around without driving. The post author says, are folks who aren't from your community not entitled to the core tenant of public libraries access to information? One, she used the wrong word. It's tenant, T-E-N-E-T, -E -E not tenant as in someone who rents an apartment. Let's not let this taint her credibility. And yeah, you know what? The library may be free, but it's a government service, which means it is paid for by taxpayer money. And the money is not infinite. If it's a community library, it is serving the needs of its community. It's so crazy to me that the person writing this is a librarian, but everything she writes in this article does not reflect my experience, not only of the library where my mother works, which is the library that I used when I was growing up, the library that I used at my university, the library that I used when I studied abroad in the UK, or accessing libraries here in New York City. Nothing she's saying reflects my experience. If you are living in a place temporarily, if you're just passing through for a weekend and you need library access, there's always a way to get some kind of guest access or temporary access. Then she makes this point about young people not being able to get library cards unless their parent can prove their identity, which requires the parent to have the time to show up with their child and provide appropriate proof of residency. It's not like they have to come in with their child all the time. It's a one-time thing. If they don't have like two hours to drive to the library, sign up their kid, drive them home, like ever, they never have that time, WTF is their life. Also, I should make a point on behalf of my mother that the library is not your babysitting service. I mean, you can leave your kid there as long as you, you know, pick them up. You'll get parents who don't give a crap. They will leave their kid at the library all day. They will fail to come pick them up on time. So the librarians can't leave because there's a minor there. And my mother has been on the brink of having to call the cops several times because there's an unaccompanied minor that's just been left there. She talks about library fines and how those are a barrier to access. Um, no, they're actually not a barrier to access. You only get library fines if you don't return your books on time. Most libraries give you a pretty generous checkout window, probably minimum two weeks to three weeks. Generally, you can renew. So if you can't make it into the library in time, you can re-up for another week or two. And in current year, you can always access eBooks without ever incurring library fines. But again, the library is not a free service. It is a taxpayer paid service. These resources are for everyone, not just you. It's not a bookstore. You didn't buy the books. Other people want to read those books. Other people deserve to have access to those books the same as you. Everyone is sharing from a common pool of resources. If you're not able to bring the book back in time, fine. They're not going to come to your house and kick down the door, but they're going to ask you to pay some money. And the library fines are usually really low. It takes a while for you to accumulate anything remotely crazy. And there's usually a cap at like $25 or something. What she's really talking about here is not issues about people of color. It's poor people, people without access to computers, people without access to cards, which does not describe all non-white people, not even close. So both of my parents in poverty were able to use the library and return their materials on time. So again, this feels like bigotry of low expectations. I have to look into this more. She makes this claim about how we can thank the Patriot Act 
for a lot of the measures in libraries to protect privacy. Seeing the words, we can thank the Patriot Act just made my head almost like spin completely around. And so I'll have to look into that one. If anyone knows the explanation for that, feel free to let me know. This one really got my mother going, which is that it is white supremacist to require advanced degrees and ALA accreditation. Now, ALA, my mother is not a fan of because it's an elitist institution. It has nothing to do with whiteness. It's elite. My mother is a community librarian. So the things that ALA talks about in terms of their agendas and programming and whatever really has very little to do with the reality on the ground for her. She's made comments like, I don't think at the ALA conferences, they explain to you what you're supposed to do when a homeless guy pulls up in the bathroom. And they probably don't give you any advice on the aforementioned situation of a parent leaving their kid at the library all day and failing to show up on time to pick them up. They probably also don't give you any guidance on what to do when someone comes to you and says that the guy next to them in the computer lab was watching porn and touching themselves. Good times. These are real examples straight from the librarian's mouth. So I'll largely ignore the ALA thing and just comment on the MLS, the Master's in Library Science. This chick says that public librarians do not need a master's degree to help people. Period. End of statement. The master's degree is but a coupon proving you've had access to capital in the form of time, money, and education. It doesn't mean you know how to help people any better than someone who has worked in any other job. Sure, you learn some resources and tools to find information, but chances are someone who has a high school degree can easily figure out those same resources and tools. Chances are too, many of those who did not attend an advanced program are well-read and assets to their communities in ways no degree could offer. The insistence that the education matters is supremacy in action. It doesn't. The skills can be taught on the job or through trade classes and programs at low or no cost to the student. Instead, the need for a master's degree privileges the few who can afford the hoop jumping to land in the field. Unfortunately, where library schools can do work teaching how to navigate databases, they don't offer the hands-on skills needed to work with a diverse public comprised of humans. I've been of the belief that those who've worked in what now are considered essential jobs, retail and food service specifically, are among the best librarians. They know how to listen to, talk to, and help people face to face. They don't need a fancy degree to separate themselves as humans from other humans. Where do I even begin to comment on that? My mother was not pleased to read someone describing her advanced degree as a coupon. And the fact that she said it's only available to the people who can afford the hoop jumping is hilarious because my mother grew up in the projects on welfare and yet she got an MLS because, you know, there's like merit-based aid and loans. And MLS was a crucial part in my mother's upward mobility. Oh wait, I forgot she's white. So it was obviously her whiteness that allowed her to get the MLS. The fact that this woman thinks that the kinds of people who work in retail and food service jobs have the skills to help people People in libraries is hilarious. Like, yes, they have the kind of customer service experience, the like dealing with the public, the fact that you don't get to choose who you interact with. It's just whoever walks in off the street. Like, yes, that is transferable experience. But I feel like the attitude of most people who work in retail and food service is not exactly the attitude that you want in the public library. And there are definitely people who work in the public library who have a similar attitude, but I don't think we should be encouraging that. I have no idea what kind of library this chick has worked in, but she seems like one of the librarians who doesn't actually want libraries to be libraries anymore. She just wants them to be like community centers that help people, which is not what a library is supposed to be. Libraries help people access information, yes. So historically they've had tax forms available for people who are filing their own taxes, other similar simple government forms. My mother has fielded all kinds of weird requests over the years. They used to get a guy who would just call in and ask for the time of the sunset. I always kind of wondered if he like needed that information for some sort of blood ritual. They used to get a guy who would call in asking for help with crossword clues and people come in who just need help finding information. Having access to the computer is not enough because they don't have enough skills to actually find the information, especially older people. So having a degree that has trained you in how to access information is helpful. She says English only materials and signs are white supremacists because likely your community doesn't only speak English. Again, your community may vary, girl. That's what you've said. And if you don't have a staff member who can translate, that's inexcusable. Libraries have limited budgets. They have limits to who they can hire. My mother, who's not a native Spanish speaker, often would translate because their community is full of Spanish speakers. And everyone was always very surprised at how well the gringa spoke Spanish. But she wasn't hired for that purpose. She was just the only one who could speak Spanish. I don't know if that's changed. But again, I have no idea who the audience for this piece is because I feel like the kind of people who would read this piece are not the kind of people who have any 
influence on hiring, budget, etc. They can go complain to the higher ups, but from the 20 plus years of stories I've heard from my mother while working in her library system, I can tell you how effective complaining to the higher ups is. At least this chick admits that the bread and butter of libraries are books. Then she has some BS about dress codes and behavior expectations that enforce white norms. Do you expect anyone with a head covering to remove it? I have never been into a library that would expect someone with a head covering, which I assume they're referring to Muslims who wear head coverings, people from certain African nations, etc. No one would ever be asked to remove such a head covering. And for her to insinuate that is such a weak ass straw man. She says libraries in the last few decades have prided themselves on no longer being quiet places. Citation needed because I've been going to libraries for my entire life, which would be the last few decades, and they are still quiet places and expected to be quiet places, and most people would like them to remain so. Hey! 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 People power. Hey! This is library. But apparently, like I posited earlier in this video, behavioral expectations of quiet fall under white supremacist ideals. Whose voices and experiences are impinged upon and which ones are given a pass? All I can take from this is that she thinks that non-white people are loud AF by nature and they need to be allowed to just express that loudness or they're being suppressed by the thumb of white supremacy. Then she has some BS about how Dewey's system is racist and the article she links to is nothing about how he constructed the system in a racist way, just that he was is racist, therefore the system he created is racist and has no value to us and we shouldn't use it anymore. Again, the librarians who work at the library have no actual power to shape bigger picture policies at their library. They can decide on certain aspects of programming, they can decide on what goes in the displays, they can decide on certain conduct policies and things like that, but most of the other stuff is library wide. Then she has some BS about how it's expensive to get professional development. To me this is just more equating of non-white people with poor. There are plenty of white people who can't afford like $150 per seminar from ALA. When I was young, my parents were not flush with cash. My mother was white, but she was not able to afford professional development either. She goes on about how everyone should have a paid hour of work time per week dedicated to their professional development, which could be lunch with a colleague at another library or reading professional literature without any expectation of doing anything with it basically. Or it could be getting out of the building and putting in an hour of working in the dirt at a local community garden because planting and weeding alongside the people served likely offers far more in terms of development and knowledge than pricier, more distant options. Like how is what she just said not like elitist white supremacist talk? She's like, uh, people should be given the opportunity to, you know, like mingle with the people, you know, those underprivileged, diverse, not like me people, you know, I need to like get to know them because because their whole experiences as people is just so alien to me. You'll get to know the people and the needs that they have by when they come into the library and they ask you for stuff. You start to notice these are the books that the kids are asking for. This is the kind of information that people are looking for. These are forms that would be good for us to carry. Here are some things we might make handouts for people about because we keep getting asked about it. WTF does working in a community garden have to do with being able to provide appropriate services to the people in your community at at the library. Please explain. She says, imagine giving staff an hour of professional development time a week that could lead them to participating in a Black Lives Matter event, asking questions about how the library can better serve Black people in their community, and then bringing that information back and making changes immediately. Dear God, I do not want to live in that world. I totally forgot to read out this amazing line early in the article when she says, as always when it comes to anti-racist work, if your first thought is, but why, or any variation therein, your work is to pause and ask yourself, why why you're even asking the question. That right there tells you where your biases lie. I already made a video about anti-racism as a religion, but dear God, if you ever needed more proof that it's a religion, the fact that you're even questioning it is evidence of your sin. I thought of this because she concludes the article by saying that but is an excuse and if you're actually going to do better rather than virtue signal about doing better, you need to sit with each and every but that comes up and question what's really at the heart of that interjection. Chances are it's white supremacy and racism in action. I'm out. I just, what even?
what even? So this is the kind of stuff I send to my mother. And like I said, as you might imagine, she is just so overjoyed to see these links in her inbox. I can make many more videos about the topic of anti-racist work and white supremacy in libraries. So let me know if you want to see more of that content, but that's where I will leave it for now. If you have any comments on this video, suggestions for further topics, comment down below, DM me on Twitter, send me an email, etc etc. There are many ways to reach me. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe and I will have more content for you very soon.